Bagels and mezzanotto, what I can you share? Just a few seconds. And kosher, by the way. Kosher too. Where did the toaster if necessary? Good morning, Kahal Kadosh, Veruchim Abayim to everybody. Today, Wednesday, the 13th day of Islev, corresponding to the 17th day of November 2021. Today's class and breakfast, graciously sponsored by the Falak family, Le'ayun Nishmat, the beloved mother, Mrs. Molly Falak from Brooklyn, New York, Mazal Bat Faride Ali Shalom. Additionally, today's class, graciously sponsored by Mrs. Rebecca Yochai and family, Le'ayun Nishmat, her beloved father, Mr. Enrique Guterman, Herschel Ben Sostre Yosef, Alava Shalom, Giratzon, that to the words of Torah, both Neshamon, have an aliyah in Gan Eden. Amen. I'm going to lower and drop the volume since I hear a lot of echo. Beautiful, better. Before we actually begin today's class, I'd like to give a brief introduction to the topic that the Gemara will discuss today. So the topic of today is the topic of embarrassing someone. In Torah language, it's called boshet. We all know that embarrassing someone, in public especially, is a prohibition. Is the person, it's literally killing that person. But before we go into that, let's read quickly the Mishnah to introduce this Gemara of today. Gemara from Baba Kama, chapter 8. Ahobel behavero, a person that hurts his friend physically. Hayam mishum hamisha levari. It's guilty of paying five penalties. Number one, nezek. Nezek literally means the damage of what did you do to the person. Now, how do we assess the damage? It all depends on what the person body was. If the person uh, used to uh, drive a taxi, has the shalom, and the person lost an eye, now with one eye you can drive. So that's how you assess the value of a person with two eyes or one eye. That's only an example. Number two, sad. How much was the pain and suffering that the person experienced for this situation. Ripui, medical bills, physical therapy, prescriptions, whatever matters of medicine are required. Shevet, loss of income. Now this person got hurt, cannot work, cannot walk, has a disability case, and for three, four, six months, he cannot go to work on a regular basis. How do you substitute that income to the home? And the fifth one, bullshit, embarrassment. And the Mefarshim explained what does it mean, embarrassment? Embarrassment that the person was hurt publicly, and therefore, for that embarrassment, let's say that started to fight and hurt the person, that shame that a person experienced also needs to be paid. So my suggestion is, keep your hands to yourself. <laughs> That's it. Don't get excited, doesn't matter what, who you are, doesn't matter what did you eat, doesn't matter what did you drink. You keep to yourself. Even to lift the hand against another uh, Jew, uh, another person, but especially against another Yehudi, it's already called Rasha, from the Torah. No, Amen Musar, the Torah. When Moshe Rabbeinu, remember Moshe Rabbeinu sees the Tan and Avidan, Bayomar la Rasha, Lama ta ketra echa. What are you about to hit? He didn't hit him. What did he do? He lifted his head. Literally, in a threatening way. That's why. Keep your hands to yourself. Sometimes when people speak, and I had a case not long ago, people speak like this. And guess what? I had to be the referee. 
like in, 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 a, in a boxing match. Baymet, true story that happened not even 96 hours ago. There was an argument out of business, and a fellow started to point the finger. You do this, you do this, you do this. The guy said, you keep pointing the finger at me, you're going to have to call Hatzalah. True story, by the way. True story. I said to him, keep your hands to yourself, and the next time you speak like that, you're no longer welcome to our synagogue. That's simple. Uh, when I have to put my, my sherry face, I do it. You were there by accident? No, I was there to settle a financial dispute. Oh, so they called you that? Yeah, but okay, I don't do only weddings. <laughs> I, I put up fires also. <laughs> I'm a witness to that. Yes, you understand? So, I gave you this, right, right. Remember those days? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Maybe a lucky question if you can do that. You know, maybe in the olden days, our parents used to talk like this to us. Maybe, maybe. Okay, but from a father to son, children 20, 30 years later, you know, it's one thing. But between people, definitely out. Now, so the Gemara, interesting, begins with the following statement. The Mishnah mentioned different scenarios to assess shame, embarrassment. In Spanish it's called vergüenza. Avalsar, what about suffering? You cause suffering to a person. How do you fix this avon of causing suffering? So the Gemara says something very powerful and scary. And it says, Afilu hevi kol elene bayot shebaulam. Yani, even if he brought, let's put it in American English, Aberdeen Angus cows. Jacob, <laughs> eh? When you buy meat, there are different madregot. USDA's choice, USDA prime. Aberdeen Angus, aged meat, marbleized meat, okay? Uh, Bet Yosef, of course. Uh, Wagyu, also. Venison, you know, a lot of different types of meat. And I don't know which one is the most expensive. Probably Aberdeen Angus is the most expensive. But in the sense of imagine yourself that a person cause pain and suffering to another individual. And you want to ask Hashem for forgiveness. You know what the Gemara is telling you? You don't have to ask forgiveness only from Hashem for, cause, for causing pain and suffering to another person. You have to go to the person that you caused the pain. And that's what the Gemara says. Even if, <coughs> excuse me, even if you brought the most expensive offering, offering of a korban, any hamlo, not forgiveness, until when the Gemara answers, until you ask the person for forgiveness. We learn this halachot, aseret yemet teshuva, the 10 days of teshuva, and we learn that a person halachically must go three times at least to a person, not to a rabbi or to a parent. To a rabbi and to a parent, a filu elef pe'amin, even a thousand times. To a stranger, three times. Go and ask for forgiveness. If you did something to him. Of course, of course. And if you have to ask for forgiveness, it means that you did something to him. Okay, that's one thing. Now, on the way the Gemara learns from that you need to go to the person directly. By the way, it's not so easy sometimes. You go one time and the person says, I don't want to forgive him. You go a second time, I don't want to forgive him. Goes a third time, I don't want to forgive him. The Laha says, Chazaku Baruch, you fulfill your minimum required obligation, Move on with your life. 
And that's why the Rambam, like what Maimonides, in the laws of the Shubah, write that a person, the victim, so to speak, lo achzari, don't act in a cruel way. But if they come and ask you for forgiveness, forgive and move on. And I know that whenever we come across this type of Gemara or Halakha message, always the question comes up, Rabbi, what if the person hurts you a lot? I don't have that answer. There are many ways of hurting people. Sometimes you hurt someone and they are PTSD for 30 years. Sometimes you hurt someone in such a way that you created a traumatic feeling about this person here. Not in the heart, in the mind. So each case, each case obviously must be handled by its own particular scenario, by its own particular merit. What I'm trying to gather from this Gemara is that a person needs to understand that feelings and emotions are part of Avodat Hashem. It's like we learned last night. We had a beautiful program last night. Many of you were there, Baruch Hashem. A beautiful program. And you know what was the introductory statement of the program? From the Yesod and Shodesh Avodah, it says that a person must seize the opportunity that a Kadosh Baruch Hu gives each and every one of us to work on the Shalom Bayit on Shabbat. Hidush. I never saw such a thing. I saw written that on Friday afternoon, the person needs to be extra careful to make sure that there is no drama at home. Because the Yeserara looks for customers on Friday afternoon for many reasons. Reasons. Reason number one, that is the first time that he enticed someone to do an avon, Adam and Habab. So every Friday afternoon, the Yeserara says, I want to celebrate. I need customers. Guess what? Some are repeat customers, because every Friday is an old drama at home, has the shalom, and sometimes can be a new customer. But what's the ultimate goal of the Yeserara? says the Yesod Mishonesh Ha'amodah. Not only to, to ruin the Friday afternoon Shabbat preparation, but to carry that tension at home into Shabbat Kodesh, into the Friday night at home. Husband comes from home, remembers that he had an argument with his wife. And now he's asking himself, do I need to say Yeshet Hai tonight or not? C'est vrai. It's true. I had this question many years back. True story, by the way. That was this question. A fellow came to me and he says, I had an argument with my wife, Ayel Shabbat. He asked me this uh, Shabbat morning. And I really didn't feel, thank God he asked me for Shabbat morning. Because I have to wait a whole week now to make it up, okay? And he asked me, do I need to say Eshet Haim? I don't feel that she's an Eshet Haim. Whoa. Oh, say it twice. Say three times. What do you think? My customers are like you, nice, normal, down to earth people. I have a whole list of headaches. Has Are they still married? Huh? Yes. They still marry because he did the smart thing. He did, he did say they should hide. I said, the first thing I asked him was, did you say it or not? He says, of course, Rabbi, I said it. He says, I'm very happy that you said it, because if you don't have said it, your wife would have called me Sunday, Rabbi, call the Bedin. Oh my God, <laughs> so serious. Yes, of course. Now, when I talked to him afterwards, and I said, Explain to me where this type of question comes from. So he tells me that on a Friday afternoon, he had a mahloket, an argument with his wife. And when he came back from shul, she had a long face, like Ishaviyat. 
<laughs> right, has the shalom. The table was set up, but yeah, I'm okay, eat and get it over with. I said, what did you do at the end? He says, I said, they should hide. And was she okay? He said, at the end of the meal, she was okay. So he said, I show him. She okay? He said at the end of the meal she was okay. So he said, I show him the halakha that says on a Friday afternoon, go against your own will in the sense of exercise as much as self control that you can to avoid the mahloket lingering into the Shabbat night dinner. And that's one of the reasons why we say Shalom Alechem. You know that in certain communities, if there is shalom by issues, they don't say Beshitechem de Shalom. True, by the way. We say, oh, Shalom Alechem, Boachem, Balchuni, Beshitechem, Besetechem. In some communities, they never say Besetechem. Right? They don't say Besetechem. They don't. Other communities, they skip Beshitechem and they say Besetechem. Why they skip Beshitechem? So if you look in the fine print, is because since they know that their house has Shalom Bayit issues, they don't want the Malachim to witness what's on, what goes on between husband and wife. And that's why he said, Beset Techem, leave. If you ask my opinion, I am I'm not in favor of that mindset. Since the opposite, if you have a Malachim, you have something, maybe the presence of the Malachim will calm down the environment at home. But to summarize this Gemara, the Gemara is teaching us, don't minimize pain and suffering. So, and this is the Gemara talking between two people. The Peleyo Es, the Peleyo Es on the topic of suffering says that even the suffering that we cause someone, and let's really not, let's not really call suffering. I think that the word suffering uh, comes in different levels, different levels of suffering. Some people, the weather is not the way they want it, they start suffering, God forbid, okay? Has the shalom. And for some other people, suffering means sar, mamash. But the Peleo says that even if the person committed an action without having the intent of causing suffering, in other words, in your mind, what did you do? You did something that is not a big deal, but it caused suffering to somebody next to you. There is a liability on that as well. For I bring you one example, the Peleo Ice breaks down. Let's say that there is a fly here, a fly, mosquito, okay? No, mosquito fly in Spanish, this is a mosca, okay? Mosca, okay, so what do you do? You see it here, and with your napkin, you took a napkin, you're the hero now. You came, and you did your hit out to that fly. But you hurt the other guy. You hurt the other guy. Now, how did you hurt the other guy? You killed the, the, this, this insect. Maybe. It says, you know, how did you hurt him? By doing something that created a repulsive feeling to the person. That's simple. So imagine yourself, God forbid, when somebody curses another person, husband shalom, or curses a spouse. And I say the word spouse because sometimes the wife can speak or the husband can speak, doesn't matter who they are. It seems from the Gemara perspective that either way, is also uh, inappropriate and there is a liability, a spiritual liability that a person experiences in this particular uh, matter. The Gemara switches the tone on something different now. So that was one topic. The Gemara in Baba Kama as well. The Gemara discusses praying for other people. We all pray for other people. And we pray for ourselves. So the Gemara says, very simple. A person who prays to a Kadosh Baruch Hu 
to have mercy on someone. Let's say you pray for someone to have parnasa. Who doesn't need parnasa? If you are human, you need parnasa. Bottom line, doesn't matter, young, old, uh, man, female. And the person has the same need. But you pray for someone else. When you have that need, the Gemara concludes, who ne'ayna tehila, your tefillah that you pray for someone else, that tefillah has a boomerang effect that not only takes care of that person, but you get answered first. Why? I think the Peshat is because Shalayim is filtering the tefillah and they say, look at this fellow. He's praying for someone else when he or she has the same need. Oh, you put somebody else's needs ahead of yours? Do two for one. His and yours as well. And where do we learn this from the Gemara? From the story of Abraham and Abimelech. The Gemara quotes the Pasuk quickly. By Palel Abraham Elohim, by Elohim et Abimelech, and then by Hashem Pakadet Sarah. Remember when Sarah was taken by Abimelech? That night, we already learned this a few weeks ago, that everyone became barren. No one was able to produce anything. And Abraham Avinu prayed for Abimelech and his wife. They were healed. And the Pasuk after says, Hashem pakad et Sarah. Hashem remember that Sarah was barren. And remember just, Sarah in this Pasuk was married to Abraham Avinu for 75 years. This was, or oh, 74. This is the chronological chain of events. She was 15 when she married Abraham. She was 90 when she, Ishaq Avinu, was born. So how many years went by? 75, take nine months of pregnancy, for example. This So 74 years, how her reproductive organs became reactivated when Abraham Avinu prayed for Abimelech, as the Pasuk says, by Palel Abraham El Ha'elokim. Beautiful, beautiful message, the way the Gemara concludes. We'll switch the topic now. Yesterday, we discussed the Zohar Kadosh about Yaakov Avinu. The Zohar tells us that Yaakov Avinu comes to Isaac and one of the last things we learned in yesterday's class was how did Yaakov Avinu Shalom prepared himself to meet Isaac. And we learned three tactics. Number one, praying, tefillah. Number two, doron. Doron means gifts. He sends them gifts in order to appease the mind of Isaac and Milhama and getting ready to go to war. But the Pasuk also tells us, interesting Pasuk, he went ahead of his wife and children, and he bowed down seven times. Ask the Zohar Kadosh, how is it possible that Yaakov Avinu bows down to Isaac? Based on what we learned yesterday, Isa was Tum'ah, Sitra Hara. So how do you bow down to Sitra Hara? Especially Abraham Avinu, that was the Behir Sheva Avot, the Zohar Kadosh. So the Zohar answers, and the Zohar makes the question even higher, you cannot bow down to Abodah Zarah. So the Zohar Kadosh says no. The Zohar Kadosh explains, that when Yaakov Avinu was bowing down, he wasn't bowing down to Isal, Ela ha to Hashem's holy presence. So imagine yourself the following scenario. Yaakov is coming from here, Isal is here, but Hashem's presence is here. 
Isaac doesn't see Hashem's presence. Isaac probably didn't believe in God, Mr. Bar. Okay, so when Yaakov Avinu is bowing down, sure, to Isaac it gave the impression that he was bowing down to him. But actually, Yaakov Avinu was bowing down to Hashem. We found a similar scenario with Elisha Hanavi and Naaman. Naaman was a boy, was a, a boy that was afflicted by Sarat. And when Naaman came to the town where Elisha was, Elisha sent them a message: Go and dip yourself in the water. Why? El Naaman had soldiers who heard of the reputation of Elisha. And they say, look, we come to this village, we come to this town, there is a holy rabbi, go get a blessing. Now a man didn't believe in Hachamim, he was a boy. He didn't believe in Berachot. He says, I'm not going. Elisha was a Navi. He sends a message to Naaman, before you come see me, go to the mikveh. Yani, go to the water. And what does Elisha, what Naaman says to the messengers, a hazard mind bear, then a, a big deal. I, I took a shower yesterday, I have to take a shower again today. But the people with him says, what do you have to waste? Go to the water and go back to see the Navi. So the Pasuk tells us what happened with Naaman when he came out of the water. His skin was like a baby. Refuash <coughs> When Naaman saw this, he changed his heart. He goes to Elisha. He talks to Elisha, and Elisha takes care of him in the sense of, you know, he talks to him, must be on him to believe in Hashem. And he tells him, don't convert. Be a, 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 a righteous Gentile. Fulfill the seven Noahide laws. Shiva Mizvot Bene Noah. One of the two Mizvot that the uh, world must follow is A, Emunai Nakadosh Baruchu, and B, No Abuda Zara. There's five more, but these are the two. So Elisha uh, uh, Naaman says, Okay, I take upon myself to believe in Hashem, but not to do Abuda Zara. Okay, I bless you to be successful. Before the Aman leaves Elisha, he says, Hacham, I have a situation. So what's your situation? I'm the bodyguard, the head bodyguard of the king. And the king goes to this church of idolatry. And he bows down every time he goes in. So what I'm going to do? If I say I'm not going to bow down, they want to kill me on the spot. It says very simple. Very simple says Elisha to Naaman. Go with him. Continue being the head uh, secret service, they call them, of the king. But when you bow down, have kavana that you're bowing down to a Kadosh Baruch. Hu. I know that from this story, we cannot derive halachot. Don't derive practical lesson from the story. Because we have to understand, the answer of Elisha was to Naaman. Specifically, that he was in a very peculiar situation of being the head fellow to protect the king. But in a way, what Elisha and Navi said to Naaman is exactly what the Zohar Kadosh of today says. What the Zohar Kadosh is saying, to the public, it look like Yaakov is bowing down to Isaac. But Yaakov was actually bowing down to the Shekhinah, to the holy presence of Hashem that came to greet Yaakov Avinu after being outside of Eretz Israel for 20 years. Now, the Zohar enhances this question, but I think that I gave you more or less the highlight and the 
a summary. So the Zohar Kadosh asks, but hold on a minute, the prohibition of the Torah is to bow down to an idol, to a statue, not to a human, with the exception of Haman. Remember the story of Haman and Mordechai in Purim? The Megillat Esther says, O Mordechai, lo ichra lo Mordechai will not prostrate, will not bow down to Haman. Why not? Everybody did with the exception of Mordechai. So one answer is that Haman, in his garments, put images of Abodah Zara. Abodah Zara means idolatry. He put images of idols in his garments to entice the people to bow down to him, Kabiachol, like if he was a god. But the question that pops up is, I don't understand. The whole world and Jewish nation bows down to Haman, with the exception of one. Can you imagine? Ish Yehudi Haya Beshushan Abira was one Jew, was only one Jew in Shushan. There were thousands of Jews, but one that did not bow down. And the question is, how come? How come that Haman, Mahila, Mordechai, does not bow down to Haman? Short answer, the Zohar Kadosh explains the following. Who was the great-grandfather of Mordechai? Binyamin. Binyamin, from the sons of Yaakov, was the only one that did not bow down to Isaac. Binyamin is born after. Binyamin is born after. Exactly. That's the day that Rahel Imenu Shalom passed away on the day that Binyamin was born. We discussed this in the yard site of Rahel Imenu. But the, there was no Pegam in Binyamin. Every one of the brothers of Yosef, including Yosef, bow down to Isaac. Binyamin, the fact that he was not born, so there was not this issue with Isaac or translate that relationship, Haman, Mehila, Binyamin, Isaac, Haman, Mordechai. They both directly connected. It was Isaac, Eliphaz, Amalek, a couple of generations, Haman. Binyamin, Shaul Amelech, the way the Pasuk says, Ben Yair, Ben Shimei, Ben Kish, Ish Yamini. So direct, direct lineage, Mordechai to Binyamin, direct lineage, Haman, Amalek, Isab. But since Binyamin did not bow down to Isab in this week's Benasha, that created a certain level of extra kedusha to Binyamin that the effect was seen many years later in the time of Mordechai Asadi. Where do we see a similar pattern of an, a situation that took place centuries ago? The fear of a blemish still exists. Short answer, Moshe Rabbeinu and Yehoshua bin Nun. What happened with Yehoshua bin Nun? We all know the happy ending of the story. Yehoshua bin Nun went to Israel. He came back with a positive report together with Caleb and Yafune. They survived. The other ten died. But the Pasuk writes that Moshe Rabbeinu prays for Yehoshua. And you ever ask yourself, why did Moshe pray only for Yehoshua? If it's me, I pray for everybody. But why did Moshe pray from Yeshua? Short answer, Yeshua's great-grandfather, who was Yosef HaSaddik. What was one of the problems of Yosef HaSaddik? That he spoke Lashon Ara about his brothers. Bayavi Yosef and Dibatam Ra'a Yosef spoke Lashon Ara about his brothers. So what Moshe Rabbeinu says, hold on a minute. 
Yoshua is a direct grandson from Yosef. Maybe there is a cell called Lashon Ara that was not purified yet, and now Yoshua will be making a negative comment like his great, great, great grandfather said about his brothers. Now, make the Heshbon. How many years were between Yosef and the story of the Meragelim? At least 237 years. 227. Give or take. Okay? I ask you a question. Are you going to start thinking about something that happened over 200 years ago? To, to suspect maybe there is a cell called the Shonara? Guess what? You know what? The short answer is yes. The short answer is yes. What Binyamin did not do in front of Isaac kept Mordechai with the strength not to bow down to Haman. And that's why Moshe Rabbeinu was afraid about, so we see the happy ending of the story, that Yoshua Binun did not speak Lashon Ara about the land of Israel, and why was Moshe Rabbeinu, I throw this as a freebie, why was Moshe Rabbeinu afraid of Yoshua bin Nun, of lying or saying Lashon Ara about the land of Israel? Because Yoshua bin Nun heard the prophecy that Moshe will perish and Yoshua will become the leader of Israel. So Yoshua, Moshe Rabbeinu says, Yoshua could go, can go to the land of Israel, come back with a derogatory report about the land of Israel, so the Jewish people will refuse. We're going to create a political movement, so to speak, like it's happening in Cuba and all over the world. We're going to do a protest. We don't want to go to Israel. But not because Israel was bad, because they knew that the moment that we move into Israel, the days of Moshe Rabbeinu are counted. I mean, you got to, you follow, you need a GPS for that, you need a tracker, very clear, right? That's what the Zohar Kadosh says. One more. One more. There was an incident that transpired in the book of Shemuel Hanabi. There was a fellow, problematic fellow, but much problematic. His name was Naval Hakarmeli. Naval already tells you the name. Nebela. Nebela. Now, in low life. Mm. He was a problematic person. He was the one who made a Saudat Hoda'an when Shemuel Hanabi passed away. Can you imagine the entire town is going to the burial of Shemuel Hanavi and you make an engagement party that night? I, unacceptable. He said, I'm thanking God for a successful year in the field. So the Pasuk tells us the type of event that he made. David, just to give you a brief historical background, he was literally running for his life, as we know, and had followers. And they were traveling in the mountains area, and they were starving. They heard that Naval was making a Saudat Hoda'a, and they sent messengers, maybe they have leftovers, yeah, and you see you have leftover bagel, bring leftovers, something that is not, that is not open, and we'll eat. When he, uh, they asked Naval, can we take the leftovers? They say, Naval said, no, you cannot take anything, go back. They come back to report to David. David says, go tell him that he can corroborate with his workers in the field that more than once we save his flock, we save his animals from criminals. Naval is told, he sends a message to David, 
I didn't ask you to do it. You did it by yourself. Zero. No hakarata tov. You know what David wanted to do? Get rid of him. Abigail, married to Naval, eventually she will become later on the wife of David Abel. She takes food and gives it to David and apologizes for the erratic behavior of her husband. The next day, the wife in conversation with the husband, what happens? She tells him, by the way, sweetheart, I hope you don't mind. I gave the leftovers from the Sauda last night to David because they were starving. He became sick that day because in his mind, sharing and caring for others was not part of his vocabulary. He became sick. He died in 10 days. Why? Shamayim refused to give him a lifeline of living through Kippur and achieving a certain level of forgiveness. There is such a thing that if a person <coughs> lives through Yom Kippur, don't try this at home. <laughs> but there is such a thing. If a person in the day of Kippur sleeps all day, only shows up a few minutes for Tal Nidre, only shows up for Ne'idah to break the fast. For the other 22 hours, you were at home sleeping. Nothing. You, you slept. Obviously, it's not the ideal. But the fact that a person's body and neshama goes through Yom Kippur day, it brings a benefit of Teshuvah to the person. He was given 10 days of Teshuvah to repent of his behavior. He refused to repent. He was taken from the world. But I gave you the historical introduction just to understand what's going on. Last week, we learned about the prayer of Ve'iten Lecha. Remember? The Beracha that Yaakov received from Ishaq. And we mentioned at the end that at the end of Beiten Lecha, there is a pasuk from the book of Shemuel that says, Be'amartem ko lechai, be'ata shalom, u'betecha shalom, bechol asher lecha shalom. Who said this pasuk? David Amelech. Who did David Amelech said this pasuk to? To Naval HaKarmeli. You know, sometimes you see, I come in peace. Where that comes from? From this pasuk. Be'ata shalom. U'betecha shalom. A blessing. So the Zohar Kadosh asks, I, I says, I don't understand. If Naval was such a wicked person, there is a pasuk that says, En shalom, amar Hashem, l'reshaim. You know what that means? That for a wicked person, that is not even to say shalom to that person. Obviously, we don't rule like that. But according to the holy books, you're not supposed to look at the face of a wicked person. Asur li stakel bifne adam rasha. Asur li stakel bifne adam b'sha'at ka'aso. Two statements of the Talmud. One statement says, don't look at a negative person. Don't look at a bad person and don't look at a person when they are upset, when they get angry. Why? Because both of them represent Abu Dazara. The angry man, Abu Dazara, we know this, and the Rasha is divorced from Hashem. Now, obviously, let's clarify, the angry man that we don't look at that person, it's common. But to say, I'm not looking at the face of a wicked person, I'm not sure how many people follow this. But, the Zohar Kadosh says that David Melech was saying this pasuk towards HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Why? The pasuk says, 
Beata Shalom. Beata Shalom. Although literally means I'm blessing you. Let's go to the translation of the Pasuk. Ba'amartem kolehai. The way you are alive today, you should be alive next year. Beautiful blessing. Beata Shalom. Peace with you. Ubetecha Shalom. And peace with your wife. Bechol asher lecha Shalom. And everything will be peaceful. And the Benishai says, say this Pasuk six times. Some say it seven times, some say it six times. One opinion says six times for the Sefirot. Chokmah, Bina, Da'at, Hesed, Gevura, no Mechila, no. Hesed, Gevura, Tiferet, Nesah, Hod, Yesod, and Shabbat is Malchut, the kingdom aspect of it. Other opinion says seven days to have peace in your home every day of the week. You don't want peace only Monday and Thursday. How about the rest of the year? Every, you say this every week. <laughs> you say this every week, you'll take care of it. That's all. Now, so it says that actually David Amelech was talking to Hashem. Bamartem Kolehai, he says to Hashem, God, like I am alive now, help me to be alive next year. Beata Shalom, you are the one who brings peace to the person. The Zohar Kadosh writes elsewhere that one of the names of Hashem is Shalom. And one of the names of Hashem is Shabbat. It's a Pasuk. So when you say Shabbat Shalom, you are saying Hashem Hashem. Goes even further than David Amelech. Eh, David Amelech was saying this to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And Naval thought that he was saying this to uh, himself. Similar to Esav and Yaakov. Esav thought that Yaakov was bowing down to him. Okay, if Esav wants to believe that Yaakov is bowing down to him, Chazak that takes care of uh, anger and animosity and hatred. Naval, the same thing. But at the end of the day, both Sadiqim, Yaakov Avinu in his situation with Isa and David and the situation with Navala Carmeli, which you can find the story of Navala Carmeli, Shemuel Aleph, chapter 25. You see the whole beautiful story there, very, a lot of things involved. And the same thing the Zohar Kadosh writes, and it says that uh, Yaakov Avinu uh, was bowing down to the Shekhinah. And the Zohar Kadosh goes further and it says, that when Yaakov Avinu sends and saw the holy presence of Akadosh Baruch Hu, he bowed down seven times. Ad Gishto, Ad Ahiv. It says, until he was able to arrive to his brother. Interesting enough, the Pasuk didn't say, Baishtahu Le'esav. He bowed down directly to Esav, but he, as he was bowing down, he was getting closer and closer, and the Zohar Kadosh concludes and it says, uh, these ma'asim were done with great kavana, that his actions were earmarked only to give kavod to the Shekhinah, and not to give a false honor to uh, Yaakov Avinu, to Isav Arashah, but though in the mind, in the mind of Isav, you know, for his ego, was acceptable move, because sometimes, there is a concept that sometimes a person may do something slightly different or say something different just to preserve the peace. Just to preserve the peace. Sometimes people want to be exacting. And although honesty and truth and exacting, it's important, but sometimes for the Arkeh Shalom, you know, you have to bend them. My dear friends, we'll say everybody a good day. Tiskela is got to today's sponsors. May the Neshamot have an aliyah in the Eden Amen. Baruch Adonai Ya'olam, Amen, 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 Amen,